actually incredibly stealth. Most, many of the bacterial infections that we encounter today are actually very easily treatable with antibiotics. Borrelia is special in the way that it's hiding, so if treated too late, it can really establish itself in some, in some really interesting kind of nooks in the body where it's then hard to penetrate with antibiotics and Borrelia can evade treatment. I always thought that viruses were so much more interesting than bacteria until I met Borrelia. It's a worthy adversary, I think, of all of our focus and, and research and attention. With it being epidemic proportion across the country, we really have kind of an imperative to develop new education, new efforts to have all physicians, all clinicians really be aware of Lyme disease. It's a global epidemic affecting many, many people. And it's like syphilis in terms of being a stealth pathogen. And people can develop serious lifelong illnesses from this. There are about 20 different tick-borne diseases that are known and new ones are coming up all the time. If you have advanced secondary and tertiary Lyme disease that's untreated, that can also cause significant morbidity and mortality. The disease is spread by ticks, and ticks have been notorious for spreading lots of different diseases. And they're, they're a vector, and they're a kind of a particularly nasty vector because they latch on and uh, you can get a, a fair amount of transfer of material from the tick to the victim. Even one tick and one bite can give you multiple bacterial infections that, that are related. Finding Borrelia in the body, not necessarily so much when it's in its highly infectious early phase, but later is very tough. If you give it a chance to establish itself in the body, now the antibiotics are no longer completely effective at clearing it. So the problem with all these chronic diseases, whether it's chronic fatigue or Lyme, is they are very complicated. And we really, our understanding is incredibly poor. I would argue we know next to nothing. When the bacteria attacks the muscle of the heart, and that's what we call a myocarditis, in that case, in severe form of the myocarditis, uh, the patient can end up with fulminant heart failure. Any form of inflammation can be part of the several factors that promote the Alzheimer's disease process. So that's, that's the connection between pathogens and infections is through inflammation. You know, men often tell you, I, I couldn't go back to do my job. You know, they've had a high level, stressful executive job. They tell you, I just couldn't do it anymore. The extreme anxiety and fears can cause children to be suicidal. With 300,000 new cases per year in a condition that has so many complex health effects, I believe that there's a recent estimate that we're spending approximately a billion dollars a year to treat people with Lyme disease for all of the different aspects of their conditions. That doesn't even include the loss of contribution in the workforce and the disability that occurs over a lifetime. We have more than ample evidence to invest in treatments and basic discovery science to understand the mechanisms of disease. Blood is not screened for Lyme disease spirochetes. Potentially there is a risk in banked blood if it's contaminated with spirochete. A mother gave the fetus um, in utero Borrelia transmission, and we are currently actively investigating that as well as sexual transmission of Borrelia from person to person. So our goal here is to come up with really valid, reliable, accurate tests to tell the patients what they have and how they should be treated. And I think that's the thing that will help us the most in these complex diseases. I think now we're past the denial stage. So I'd like to see NIH spend more money on this. There's no question that we have a clear business case for investing in science to help us understand Lyme disease.
I began to have one health issue after the other. I saw about 50 doctors before I was properly diagnosed with Lyme disease. And um, I had brought up that I had been bit by a tick. Is it possible that I could have Lyme uh, to many of the doctors? And of course, they all said, no, you don't have Lyme disease. There's no, there's no Lyme disease in California. And I'm a world champion equestrian. And I went from being able to ride very high powered horses to not being able to walk upstairs in a very short amount of time. Currently, I think a lot of people still think of this as the historical infection that was most prevalent in the Northeast, when in reality what we're seeing is that Lyme cases are being diagnosed in all 50 states. When we have an ecosystem where the white-footed mouse, which in the Northeast is the primary reservoir, where they are one of the most abundant species and they are not under the same predator burden, that they've been under previously. We see that they're spending more and more time foraging out and about and less time just burrowing, um, which they would normally do in order to hide from their predators. So if you count how many ticks are on each mouse, you see that in the absence of predators, they'll spend more time outside, they'll get more ticks on them. Now having more ticks on them increases their chance of not only being infected, but passing on the infection. There are about 20 different tick-borne diseases that are known and new ones are coming up all the time. Even one tick and one bite can give you multiple bacterial infections that, that are related. One of the things that's really tricky with, with co-infections or distinguishing different types even of Borrelia is, for example, what we've just discovered is happening in California. You might have been infected by a tick that's carrying Borrelia burgdorferi which is the type of Borrelia that causes Lyme disease and that we're looking for in these diagnostic tests. Or you may have been infected with a different type of Borrelia called Borrelia hermesi. That causes relapsing fever. Some of the symptoms overlap, and so there might be suspicion for Lyme disease and you may get tested for Borrelia burgdorferi and that would come out negative because actually you were carrying Borrelia hermesi. So that just further complicates how the different infections that the ticks are carrying can complicate which symptoms we're seeing, which tests we're running. Um, my understanding is that there are more than 20 different kinds of infections that can arise from tick bites, uh, with Lyme disease being the most prominent, but this is an example of why we need to know much more about tick-borne diseases more broadly. Borrelia needs to winter in a mammal. And so it needs to do this yearly jump where it jumps from the tick to the mammal and in the spring infects a new crop of ticks and then so on and so forth. Now, these mammals that it meant to use as the reservoir, small mammals like the mouse, we are not part of its life cycle. We are an accidental infection. It's very problematic as an accidental infection because normally bugs that evolve together with us are actually trying to cause minimal disease so that they can get optimal spread. The problem with an accidental infection is they tend to be the most aggressive. We see that with Ebola. It's gonna spread and as, the, uh, as our country warms, uh, it's gonna spread even more. There are a variety of ticks that probably uh, start carrying it. We need to have some better strategies for how to contain this disease. The Ixodes scapularis that carries Borrelia burgdorferi, it's tiny. So you're looking for a tick, it's going to be really hard to see this by eye. During the different stages of the tick life cycle, it's starting from something very, very tiny that you might even mistake for a mole to something that, that's getting larger and, and more recognizable as an actual tick. Because of the state of the diagnostics with Lyme, it brings us to a really tricky dilemma. If you just do the less rigorous first tier of screening, a lot of people will test false positive. If you do the more rigorous um, two tier testing that we currently have, more than 50% of people who are really infected with Lyme will test negative. Many diseases are not routinely screened for and Lyme is one of the classic cases. Uh, after active infection, actually it's very difficult to screen for it and we know that the diagnostic uh, tests that we have currently available actually don't catch the majority or certainly a large proportion of Lyme disease 
sufferers, but it could be passed off as any other symptoms such as rheumatoid arthritis, and, and classically, Lyme is not screened for in, in the clinic. Currently, what clinicians are being asked to do is to begin antibiotic treatment at the site of an erythema migrans. So this is a classic red rash which we often think of as being bullseye in nature. It's not at all textbook. So some rashes might look like that, other rashes might be just a big red circle that's growing and growing and growing. The problem is that not everybody is going to get this rash. And that's where the real tricky part in diagnosis comes in, people who, who don't demonstrate the rash early in infection. Early treatment is, is the most effective. Problems can occur then when you do not treat this right away, and that gets much, much more complicated. One of the things about Borrelia that's so captivating is that even though if we looked at it in a tube and we gave it doxycycline, doxycycline would kill it. But if you give it a chance to establish itself in the body, now the antibiotics are no longer completely effective at clearing it. And you have people who get antibiotic treatment and their symptoms are persisting. They're still having problems with this bacteria. So I've seen patients you know, who come to me and they've had Lyme and it's established in the records and they are left a few years later with symptoms of neurologic and some other systemic dysfunction. And we test them and we don't find active Lyme, but they clearly have inflammatory markers and their neurologic exam is impaired, you know. So what is the best approach to these patients? And I think that's what the future holds. There's a lot of frustration from patients and patient groups because they feel their condition may not be adequately addressed. And I think that in part comes from not having this ability to molecularly define and diagnose them. There are many co-infections that can occur with Lyme disease. So there might be Lyme disease itself and other tick-borne diseases, but it also might render someone vulnerable to getting other kinds of infections. And so often you're dealing not just with Lyme, but you're dealing with a number of different co-occurring conditions that, that accompany it. When you meet somebody who's infected with Lyme, you may not see anything visible that you notice that they, they may look great. A lot of the symptoms of Lyme, a lot of the suffering that happens in late stage Lyme is this debilitating fatigue, episodes of paralysis, these neurological symptoms where, where you can't find the right words, where you can't do things independently that you were able to do before, you are not able to access your short-term memory. These are incredibly debilitating symptoms that we don't see. Millions of people in this country are living with Lyme or living with the consequences of having a Lyme, Lyme disease infection earlier in their lives where it hasn't been recognized, it hasn't been diagnosed, um, they're struggling, they're having difficulties. So it is a very serious question affecting the public health. Now we've got Borrelia that's gotten into the blood and you have, your immune system has patrol cells patrolling the blood all the time. They're constantly on the lookout for bacteria, for viruses, for other things. This is a really dangerous place for a bacteria to be. So the bacteria doesn't want to hang out in the blood for very long. This bacteria wants to get out and find a nice quiet spot in the body to hide. Um, safe away from the immune system. And so this Borrelia is going to get into different organs in the body and that's something that we're actively still trying to understand. Lyme carditis is caused by the bacteria that's uh, carried inside the uh, diotic. The bacteria then travels to the heart. Uh, the bacteria attacks the heart. The bacteria can do its damage by a couple of forms. Uh, one form is when the bacteria attacks the muscle of the heart and that's what we call a myocarditis. In that case, in severe form of the myocarditis, uh, the patient can end up with fulminant heart failure, and in rare cases, uh, the patients can die all of a sudden from that. But what can a patient expect to see? In terms of the eye, they can notice a number of things. Certainly blurry vision, irritation, redness of the eye, double vision, all these things have been uh, known to happen with Lyme disease affecting the eye. People have also had facial paralysis and other changes of the eyelid and the pupil. So light sensitivity can also 
uh, be one of the symptoms patients will see. Is it possible for somebody with Lyme to go blind? It is possible. Patients can go blind from this disease. Perhaps the relationship aspect of the disease, like the spouse will tell you, it's, you know, he's not the same, or the husband will tell you, the wife, she has not been the same since so she's had that. She's better, but it's not the same. She used to be so sharp, and she's not the way she was, or like she often forgets stuff. You know, men often tell you, I, I couldn't go back to do my job. You know, they've had a high level, stressful executive job. They tell you, I just couldn't do it anymore. So Dr. Neil Spector's uh, case, I would say classic case of uh, how difficult it is to diagnose uh, Lyme carditis and Lyme uh, disease. He's a very prominent uh, oncologist at Duke. He started uh, having uh, non-specific symptoms of uh, Lyme disease uh, when he was at a young age. And it took the uh, doctors quite a long time for them to finally nail down that it's actually from Lyme disease. And he ended up with a heart transplant and he wrote a book about it to teach both the patients and the doctors the importance of uh, diagnosing uh, Lyme disease early. He ended up with a heart transplant because the bacteria it continues to wreck its uh, havoc on the heart and you end up with uh, heart failure and um, over time, uh, the, you know, the heart failure becomes, you know, irresponsive to uh, medical treatment. And then we start thinking about doing a uh, heart transplant as the last option. Probably occur more frequently than what we think because, again, we are underdiagnosing the disease. How does the Borrelia escape the blood? What determines which organs it's going to get to? Why in some people will it go to the heart, in other people it's going to be in the bladder, in other people it's going to be in the joints, in some people it's going to be in all those places. Some people it will even cross into the brain. So it'll cross the blood-brain barrier and enter into the brain, this most privileged site of ours. Any form of inflammation can be part of the several factors that promote the Alzheimer's disease process. So that's, that's the connection between pathogens and infections is through inflammation uh, potentially contributing to Alzheimer's th through the inflammation process. I think Lyme infection has been a, a bigger challenge um, because the telltale signs of it being in the brain aren't as clear, right? They're more indirect. Um, so a patient might have had a, a history of, of a peripheral Lyme infection, right? The appropriate uh, rash, for example, and some symptoms that go along with Lyme, and then they, they get the appropriate antibiotic treatment. You know, the rash disappears. Uh, hopefully, some of the, the symptoms went away. Now, as we know, unfortunately, many of those patients go on to have some kind of symptoms referable to the brain. So the, the big question is, what's causing those symptoms? It, it, are, are Lyme spirochete still present causing the symptoms? And it's been difficult to detect those, right? Or is it some leftover response of the immune system? Cognitive impairment can happen with the infection. Uh, there's no question about it. You could have dementia-like presentation, and you could have a memory-like impairment when you have inflammation in the brain from Lyme, yeah. So encephalitis can happen. If you treat it aggressively and early, if you diagnose it early, usually it's pretty irreversible. There might be minor deficit left. But if the diagnosis isn't discovered for a while and you treat it very late, there will always be some degree of cognitive impairment. And usually those patients are more of a little bit of a memory impairment, but it's more what we call executive function. I have seen though patients left with significant uh, disabling nerve problems. You know, the, their balance is off. Uh, they have uh, persistent numbness in their hands and feet. They have weakness in their arms and legs. Uh, they have changes with their blood pressure. They can't regulate their blood pressure. The digestive system is affected. The more common deficit you get in these patients will be foot weakness or foot drop, and you may need an orthotic you know, or a brace. Uh, you may need a cane sometimes for that. You get usually, often you're left sometimes with facial weakness or facial paralysis, and there will be some weakness in the hands. So in some other cases, in addition to the nerve inflammation, the inflammation goes to the spinal cord. It's less common, but it could happen. And when the spinal cord is inflamed, you know, we call it myelitis. When you get a myelitis from a Borrelia infection, again, not very common, but it could happen, then you will likely be in a wheelchair. If the treatment is delayed, usually, then the myelitis will not recover.
and therefore you are likely to stay in a wheelchair. And what we know now is like many diseases, autoimmune diseases, infectious diseases, the things were labeled as psychiatric when actually they really did have an underlying medical cause, they just didn't know what it was. We're studying a specific uh, condition called PANS, Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. And it's characterized by the sudden onset of extreme fears obsessions. I was involved in a, a case of a young girl who had a sudden onset of neurological and psychiatric uh, changes. She also had a, a rash and uh, she was diagnosed by a very thoughtful infectious disease doctor at Mass General as having disseminated Lyme and it actually went into the brain. She received a very long standard of care course of IV antibiotics but she never went back to her baseline. She continued to have fatigue and joint pain and some cognitive symptoms and it really prevented her from living a normal life. We felt that what was driving her symptoms at that stage was ongoing inflammation. So we treated her with anti-inflammatories and a lot of her inflammation symptoms got better. So she had nephritis, so a kidney problem, and that got better. Um, she had arthritis so inflammation in joints and that got better, her fatigue got better, her cognitive status got better. So it was really the combination of getting treated for the Lyme and then getting treated for the post-Lyme inflammatory condition that got her back to her baseline. We thought she was cured and we t stopped her anti-inflammatories and she relapsed. While we have her on chronic anti-inflammatories right now, um, because we've just recently got her better. So we actually don't know how long we need to treat before we stop the treatment. That's one of the questions for our research team. And we're really following kids and um, trying to understand the immune response over time. I think what happens to the kids is that the diagnosis, if it's missed, it lingers longer. And that's when they start having things like, you know, inflammation in the heart conduction, conduction system. They could, for instance, faint when they are playing sports. Uh, their joint becomes so swollen, it becomes really a problem for them. They tend to run more likely fever compared to an adult, for instance. So just this year, the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, has recognized that Borrelia burgdorferi is not only a tick-borne infection, but can be transmitted human to human in the event of a congenital infection. So a pregnant mother who is infected with Lyme disease can transmit that infection to her baby. And there have been cases documented of this. And we're missing many cases, like high percentages of cases of Lyme disease because of the diagnostic and, the, and on top of that, the diagnostic window. One of the documented cases that I'm thinking of is actually quite sad. Um, the newborn um, did not live for very long um, and at autopsy was found to have um, spirochetes in many of their vital organs. Um, so Borrelia burgdorferi was found throughout this um, newborn's body. This mother did not know that she was infected with Lyme during the pregnancy. She was tested um, upon the, the newborn's passing. So we're now starting to very precisely monitor stages of infection and the presentation of stages of Lyme infection. And we can then start to align that with pregnancy rates, sexual transmission, fetal development in pregnant mothers. We're very lucky to be collaborating with Dr. Mikhail Tal, who has such a model, and now we can ask thousands of pertinent research questions to understand sexual transmission of Lyme disease and the developmental consequences. We are now recognizing the true public health impact of Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. And so I'm hopeful that there'll be more investment to help with a greater understanding of this condition. Stanford Lyme Working Group is a diverse group of investigators with clinical expertise, uh, for example, in infectious diseases. There's people with epidemiologic expertise. There's people with translational research expertise. And so it's a true multidisciplinary, innovative research group. Included in our working group is um, Kristen Honey, who's working with the federal 
Lyme disease working group that's further establishing and assembling incidence and prevalence based on the CDC's studies. People in pediatrics, internal medicine, neurology, psychiatry, immunology, neuroscience. I mean, it's just this wonderful group of uh, very thoughtful, very accomplished uh, clinicians and scientists who are bringing their expertise to bear on these questions related to Lyme disease. Yeah, we collaborate with Columbia and physicians at Harvard and then laboratories on, in Europe. Sherry and Laird uh, Kagan, they've done a phenomenal job with this uh, stand for Lyme Foundation is to promote awareness of this uh, disease, integrate partnership among startup companies, academia, folks like us, uh, the government, the private sector, uh, the biotech and big pharma, so that all of us uh, work together uh, to come up with better diagnostic kits, uh, better treatment, better follow-up, and better long-term prognostics. As more people become aware of this disease, there will be more research, uh, more funding uh, devoted to this area, and hopefully in the end, we can cure uh, this uh, disease just like we can cure syphilis. I think Lyme disease has been in part neglected by the medical community. And I think that this has arisen because we don't have as robust diagnostics an ability to molecularly define what a patient has and what they're suffering from. And if we can usher in a new generation of, of biomarkers and diagnostics to better kind of mechanistically characterize what's happening in a patient suffering from Lyme disease, I think that that will result in um, the medical community uh, further embracing these more clinically defined conditions. I think we have to learn the epigenetics, what changes are going on when people get Lyme, when it progresses and becomes more severe. I think we also have to understand all the other molecular changes that are going on too with people's immune system, I would argue with their metabolome, and we really need what's called a systems approach. You want to not just study, you know, like the elephant, the, the trunk or the leg or the tail, you want to understand the whole thing. If we're looking at the classic known related spirochete bacteria would be syphilis to Borrelia and they are highly related. They have a common ancestry, but actually they have very large differences in terms of their genome, the genes they express, um, and that could have huge repercussions in terms of um, transmission, active response to the disease, combating the disease after transmission, um, how we really succeed in eradicating Lyme. Currently, we're using the two-tiered diagnostic system where we're looking, um, first we're running an ELISA to look for antibodies that are Borrelia specific, so antibodies against this bacteria. And the problem with that first ELISA is that it can generate false positives. And so while it's very sensitive, it may find more people to be positive than are actually infected with Borrelia. And that's due to the fact that different bacteria share some proteins, and so you may be making an antibody to a different bacteria that's similar, and this could result in a false positive on that test. And so instead of relying on that test alone, current CDC protocol requires a second test in this two-tier test. This is a Western blot where we actually are running these proteins along a gel and looking at their molecular weight and looking for specific diagnostic bands. This is very hard to read. This is subjective person to person. It takes a long time to develop and get the results of this and it's only really accurate about eight weeks into the infection, which misses that great treatment window at the beginning when we can much more efficiently eradicate the Borrelia. ELISA's and Westerns we've been running since the 1950s and 60s. Today, we have a completely different level of technology at our fingertips that we could use to develop much more specific tests. I'd probably take a lot of different approaches to be able to actually try and understand this disease. I just think that epigenetics is one of those approaches that should be explored because given that most chronic conditions really do 
lead to changes in DNA modifications, it seems like an obvious thing to look at for Lyme, which is a chronic disease and can get quite severe. We are at a revolutionary time in science where you can actually do things like study someone's entire epigenome, follow all the modifications in their DNA. That was just not possible even 10 years ago. Um, and other technologies as well are brand new. So we can really get a molecular portrait of people at a level that's never been possible. And I think to be able to apply that to the study of Lyme and then try and understand this terrible disease and ultimately hopefully, you know, make strides towards treatment is a no-brainer. Well, we need a lot more research uh, into these organisms that are able to sustain themselves in, in the human body. And they often sustain themselves because they grow slow. Uh, we see that with tuberculosis. Your body can clear fast-growing bacteria, but it's really hard for your body to clear these slow-growing organisms. So tuberculosis can escape drug treatment because it grows slowly. A lot of the drugs only kill cells that are dividing. And if the cell doesn't divide, it can't get killed. So there are uh, cases where cells will actually, uh, microbes will actually shut down uh, completely and uh, you really have a hard time killing them, and they can stay dormant for a very long time. We know the window in which we can treat, and the treatment is most likely to completely clear the bacteria out of the whole body. So for mice, if we treat in the first 56 days after infecting them, um, then doxycycline treatment would be highly effective. We know something very similar for primates. Um, what we know is, um, there, we have solid evidence to support that if we let the infection develop beyond that, and then at that point treat with the standard course of doxycycline, and for example in mice, in two out of five mice, you can still find Borrelia infection. Um, and also for primate studies, we know that doxycycline is not going to be completely effective um, once we have let the infection really start running its course. So. Currently, there are a lot of attempts to try different antibiotic protocols, different lengths of time. Some people are doing IV antibiotics for a very long period of time. This is highly controversial. The interplay between inflammation and classic diseases of aging, such as cancer, heart disease, and Alzheimer's, is uh, becoming more and more understood in as much as there is a link between um, long-term inflammation responses um, and the prevalence or increased incidence of cancer, heart disease and Alzheimer's. And what we don't understand in the case of Lyme disease is the interplay with infection and chronic Lyme and how that merges to present um, as other disease phenotypes classically known in Lyme as arthritis and fibromyalgia. Um, but what are the other adverse health consequences of long-term chronic infection of Lyme disease? And I fear that we overuse antibiotics or anti-inflammatories um, because, you know, we're not sure, but the child is in a desperate state, so we're throwing something at the child. That's, that's not good medicine. I fear the other happens too, where a child is getting psychiatric medicines or therapy that's not working because maybe inflammation is driving it. So, you know, we're we're in the dark. We're get, you know, we're we're using our best judgment, but it's it certainly could be improved upon, and we could spare these children potentially um, either unneeded therapies or therapies that are applied at the wrong time. Like for example serotonin reuptake inhibitors and um, antipsychotics and these psychiatric medicines can work very well on children in the stage of illness where they're more chronic, but it may work terribly during the acute phase. In fact, it may cause more symptoms. Dr. Spector, who uh, was a victim of uh, Lyme uh, carditis, uh, ended up with a heart transplant, made the comment that this uh, disease is uh, very similar to uh, cancer. I think it's true. You know, cancer is very smart. Uh, the job of the cancer is to evade the body's uh, surveillance immune system so that the cancer can survive and wreak uh, havoc later on. This bacteria uh, has similar mechanism of uh, evading uh, the uh, body's immune response. At about that time that we were beginning to work on 
Pirelli and Mickey Tall and I, I said, look, we have discovered that once HIV is a virus or other viruses or even malaria gets inside a cell, it hides in the cell and the immune system can't defeat it. And one of the ways that it hides is that it tells the cell to turn on a don't eat me signal for the scavenging macrophages, the eaters that eat dangerous cells, and precancer cells and dying cells and infected and inflamed cells. But if they turn on the don't eat me signal, then the macrophage comes up to it, receives the signal and just passes on by. So we thought, okay, let's see if there's any chance that Borrelia gets into a cell to protect itself from the immune response. And Borrelia, this is the speculative part, we think might use the don't eat me signal so that it can get into these cells without going into the stomach of the cell that has acids to digest it. Then that would allow it to be infected and by putting on the don't eat me signal, it would be safe. Can we block the don't eat me signal and get them to go through the stomach of the macrophage and be degraded by the acids in the stomach rather than sneak into the cell and hide out without going through the stomach. So there's a lot of possibilities. Now that we have found that Borrelia almost certainly makes a mimic of the don't eat me signal, and we have a special kind of protein that sees that mimic and sees it on Borrelia, we can ramp it up and add other things to it to say, well, how good is it at getting rid of the Borrelia itself? Or allowing the Borrelia to be eaten by these scavenger macrophages. We've developed technologies here that allow us to dig deep into a T cell response. We've seen evidence that T cells are a big part of the response to the Lyme organism, Borrelia. We're tracking down just what those T cells are doing, what they recognize, because they're recognizing things. I think because of the autoimmune-like symptoms, it's a reasonable hypothesis to say there might be some cross-reactivity between T cells that are recognizing the Borrelia antigens and also might cross-react to recognize uh, self-proteins that would cause the autoimmune symptoms. And that's a, a major um, hypothesis about autoimmunity in general is that it's tr different kinds of autoimmunity are triggered by different infectious diseases and then the immune system makes a mistake. It's, it's making a T cell and other responses against the organism, uh, but that there can be a sort of a molecular uh, mimicry that uh, means that this response could go off the rails and uh, start attacking your own tissue, which is the definition of an autoimmune disease. Or if uh, residual bacteria is, is a main driver of the disease in people with post-Lyme syndrome, that it's, it somehow hasn't been cleared out with the antibiotic and it's hiding somewhere in people's bodies, that would be a whole other scenario in terms of uh, what kind of drugs you might want to develop. where we really need probably better understanding of why this happens, how to manage it, and have a better consensus among academic and medical minds on is this really a sign of a persistent infection? And there is a huge debate on, on that. So I think this is an area where there is still unknown question mark that should be answered. We don't know why a person A gets treated and they seem to do very well, and we don't know why person B gets treated exactly the same way, and they are left with a you know, myriad of difficulties and their life is never the same. And I think that's probably the biggest issue for the future of, of uh, Lyme disease uh, research and treatment. The mental anguish that these children feel, the violent imagery, the extreme anxiety and fears can cause children to be suicidal. Um, and yes, there have been suicides from this. The fact that these kids 
can suddenly become so severely debilitated that parents will do anything to get them better, and that's understandable. And, and we don't have answers. And so oftentimes these families are left to go to other doctors that are willing to try something because these, again, these families would do anything to have their kid back. But it, those clinics aren't covered by insurance. So these families are having to sell their car, their house. Some of these families they actually have to stop working because their child is so ill, one of the parents has to stay home with the child. Economically, it devastates families. I think now we're past the denial stage and, and we're into where this is an important research question. There isn't a lot of funding right now. A lot of, uh, all our funding now is coming from private sources, uh, not, not from NIH, which has traditionally been a major funder of biomedical research. So I'd like to see NIH spend more money on this. Efforts like Sherry's uh, critically important in terms of jumpstarting the research what we have right now is kind of a wild west of trying different things, but we don't have one standard protocol that everybody is following that works. We're, we're just not there. What we need is more effort put into really developing highly sensitive and highly specific diagnostics for Lyme. We have not put enough resources at a federal level into monitoring the infection diagnostically and into understanding why some people are not responding to treatment, why it's so difficult to treat late in the infection, and what kind of treatment protocols we can adopt to successfully treat Borrelia even once it's established in the body. I'm confident that we could really, we could work this out in the same way that we've worked it out for, for other infections and other diseases where we get to the point where we have highly reliable diagnostics and we have an efficient treatment protocol. I'm confident that we could get there. If we have more tools to examine the process, then we have more chances to get at the cause of the disease and treatment of the disease. We need to understand better uh, the pathogenesis of this uh, bacteria. And the research that gets the ball rolling and gets us closer to where we can have some understanding of the disease, the more actionable that intelligence will be in terms of treatment. Um, and the more we can tell, say, pharmaceutical companies, okay, this is what you should target. Like the basic researchers in HIV, did to the pharmaceutical company say, okay, this is a virus, this is what it looks like, this is where the vulnerabilities might be in terms of drug discovery, and then the drug companies can take that information and target those pieces of the virus and, and basically stop it in its tracks. You need to have uh, institutions like the NIH and CDC get in invested in the importance and relevance of this issue and then create the funding stream akin to back in the days where the HIV awareness was breaking. The HIV patients felt really alone. That was incredibly low on the list of priorities for funding until there were more and more social awareness and people began to realize, you know what, it could be in somebody we know, a friend, you know, family, etc. And then I think the NIH, to their credit, with Dr. Anthony Fauci, they decided, you know what, they want to get involved. And then all of a sudden now, we're to the point where we have excellent treatments. But unless you take it both at the state level and at the, at the federal, national level, groups like Stand for Lyme, groups like the Lyme Association do a remarkable job, but you're not going to have a huge echo that, that reaches the uh, national ear. The expense of the country is very high. Uh, because you're taking somebody out, uh, often somebody young, uh, the workforce, they spent a lot of money uh, getting them up to that point in education and everything, and now they're not contributing to society. And not only that, but they often have to have somebody to take care of them. And that person is taken out of the workforce. So this is very expensive. And if you just look at the cost of saying hiring somebody to do that, it's a lot of money. We need to put a much bigger effort into trying to cure these diseases. We really need better education at a at a national level and at an international level of 
how prevalent this disease is. For people to be testing for this, looking for this, and actively trying to find the best possible treatment protocol so that we can catch it early and treat it early, and if it's not caught early, that we can try to find the best way to manage the disease and, and bring people back to health. There's no question that we have a clear business case for investing in science to help us understand Lyme disease. Thank you.